The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome to Kingdom Life Church. This is going to be a message for everyone to become grateful. Say, that's me. Right? Just raise your hand and say, I'm grateful. Okay. But uh, God's been laying it on our hearts um, how to cultivate uh, gratitude and thanksgiving. And for some time, uh, we've been saying, how does that operate? Because, you know, anybody can quote the scripture, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. And a lot of times people are giving thanks for stuff that they shouldn't be giving thanks for. All right. So uh, I want to kind of hash some of this stuff out this morning. I want to begin with a story from Luke 17, verses 11 to 19. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. He entered a village there. Ten men with leprosy stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. All ten cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, Praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. And this man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Uh, I think when you look at gratitude, if we're going to cultivate it from a biblical point of view, I think we need to look at the ingratitude and what causes that. Uh, so, quite simply, it's probably just ingratitude, just taking something for granted. But I want to start out with saying Thanksgiving, unsaved people can be thankful for something. Uh, when things are given to them, when they receive a gift or what have you, they can be thankful that they didn't get caught <laughs> doing something wrong. Who knows uh, what Thanksgiving means to them. But coming from the kingdom message, uh, and these ten lepers give us a little illustration uh, of what's in the heart. Uh, in John 3, it says, you will not even see this invisible realm, this kingdom, unless you're born again. So I'm looking at it from a born-again experience, from a supernatural walk with God. Gratitude and thanksgiving that comes from the spirit realm, not in the natural. Now, it says unless you even begin to get a perspective on this invisible realm, you can't enter. Okay, there's a key word there. You can't enter into the supernatural realm, even of thanksgiving, uh, but uh, something I've always observed and I've commented on it often is I noticed that in the spiritual realm, when someone is born again, you can teach them how to receive Jesus in your heart, ask him to cleanse you of your sin, and make a committal. Uh, I will live for you all the days of my life. I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. But then they, I've seen it time and time again where they said, thank you. Well, nobody taught you to do that. What was that a product of? What, where did that thank you come from in their conversion experience? Other than they entered and they have a perspective. They both saw and they both entered into a kingdom dimension, into a God dimension. Now, uh, Psalm 100, verse 4, says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, 
And uh, I always smile because I, I can't hear that scripture without thinking of the message translation where it says, enter with the password. It's thank you. You can't get in without a password. Those of you that uh, know that it's the same with a computer, all of that wonderful potential is there. But if you don't have the password, you don't get in. And it was it really it hit me that even the example in the Old Testament of seeing the uh, tabernacle, there was the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. And I saw that um, it, anything outside of the tabernacle would have been like the, considered the world. The world, the flesh, and the devil is outside there. You had to enter the gate with thanksgiving or you don't even get in. And so I think more and more there needs to be a, a, a way to learn how to cultivate this gratitude and this attitude of thanksgiving. Attitude will determine the way you perform in the, in the spiritual realm, whether you're walking in the spirit or walking in the flesh. And thanksgiving has to be understood in light of the supernatural. It has to be understood in light of the kingdom of God and the gospel of the kingdom. Um, so I, I like that. It, even the inner court, outer court, you could also look at it as the outer courts like the body, the inner courts like your soul, mind, will, and emotions, and the Holy of Holies would be your spirit, just like your three parts. Uh, and what do we do? We offer our bodies a living sacrifice. We uh, be renewed in the spirit of our mindset, mind, will, and emotions, and enter into that spiritual dominion. Uh, dimension of being one with God. And so I see this uh, three parts all need to cooperate with it. But I also want to look at it from the world's point of view. And think of it like this. Um, in the world, we've taught this before. Uh, I call it the three deadly U's. <laughs> the unknowable, the uncontrollable, and the unattainable. Now, if you look at that as your soulish nature, unsaved man, in this world, the world, the flesh, and the devil, which the prince of the power of the air has control over there, what's deadly to mankind apart from God is the mind can't comprehend everything. And what they will do is they will rationalize. They will find excuses. They will find a, a, uh, an excuse or a substitute. The uncontrollable. There's things that take place in the world apart from God you can't control. And so what do people do? They find substitute ways of controlling. Manipulation is a key one. But they find ways of controlling. And thirdly, the unattainable. The emotions in the world apart from God can't handle it. All you have to do is see anyone in the secular world go for counseling or, or help. What do they get? They can't attain emotional freedom. They get medication or of some sort, some substitute other than God is what I'm trying to say. So the unknowable, the mind can't comprehend uh, in this world. So it will have to come of its own resources. It will have to turn to itself. And uh, something I want to get into a little later on was one thing we've always taught was if you want to know the purpose of a thing, don't ask the thing. Go to the source or the creator or the manufacturer. That's where the solution is going to be. And for us as believers, it's got to be a biblical solution. The world doesn't really have anything to offer us. Um, the mind can't comprehend, the will can't control, and the emotions can't handle. And so the only thing you can do for mind, will, and emotions in your, in your natural sense uh, in this world is... Do what it says in Jeremiah 2.13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that really don't hold any water. So you have living water or your own making, your own substitute. But uh, one of the things that I see that... that if we're going to cultivate gratitude from a spiritual point of view, we've got to look at that scripture that everybody can quote it, but very rarely do I hear anybody explain how it operates. And that is 1 Thessalonians 
5.18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. The first distinction that has to be made is it's not in everything give thanks for it, but in it. There's a big difference, right? Because you got people get, oh, thank God my dog got ran over by a car. Or, you know, thank God that person I don't like just got fired. Oh, yay. You know, all of that carnality. So in everything give thanks, we're talking back to that spiritual realm where you entered with the password. You entered into an area of, a, of the kingdom of God that is both invisible to the natural eye and you cannot enter it. Entering it is an attitude of staying in kingdom realm. So my first question was, well, then how, how do we cultivate this? You know, and we're going to hash out all different uh, ways of which we can uh, improve our gratitude and have it be spiritual and not carnal. Because you can be thankful for a lot of things. Uh, thankful I got my way whether it was God's way or not, you know, that kind of thing. So I had to look to saying, well, Dennis, don't give me what you think. Uh, if we're going to learn how to cultivate gratitude from a spiritual concept, how to in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God and Messiah Jesus for you. If this is the will of God for me, I want to know how does that operate? Where do I go for it? How do I cultivate that? Uh, God's not going to change his password. He requires a heart attitude of gratitude. He doesn't want grudging duty. Even when it talks about tithing, it says the cheerful giver. That's someone that's got a thankful heart and they're generous. Uh, not a grudging person doing the right thing. You know, that's not impressive to God. So I looked and I saw, well, in cultivating this in, in the proper way, uh, I'm going to go to what the originator or the original intent or why did God make me and give me a plan and a purpose and all of that so I want to be thankful for what he would want me to be thankful for not what I think I ought to be thankful for big difference you know uh, one of the things he told me uh, years ago was on um, serving him when you think you deserve it or there's entitlement, you de-serve. You're no longer serving God. You're serving yourself. Once you think you deserve, woe is me. Okay? Uh, and, it, and it worked in the garden, didn't it? The old serpent, he told Eve, God's holding back something good. Only God is good. If you can believe that he's not good and it's somehow holding you back and you deserve, you're, you're, off, you're, you're out of that supernatural realm. And here's the thing that really hit me. If on a computer you need the password to get in, um, if you get out of it, don't you have to put the password in again the next time? So it's like if you lose that attitude of gratitude or you lose that spirit of thanksgiving, you're outside of the supernatural realm. You're in the ingratitude and it was so clear to me that if that's a password, that's the entry point. I don't want to go in and out of kingdom living. So how do I stay in? Well, you enter with the password. You enter his gates with thanksgiving. But then you've got to learn how to stay in there. So I said, <clears throat> all right, well, then how do I cultivate this? First of all, I looked at the four predestined. Uh, Jennifer discovered this years ago. She goes... We were doing our hierarchy of need. What, what, what does mankind need in order to grow layer upon layer and, and be fruitful in this world? And the four predestines in the Bible show us why God made us. You want to be thankful? Let's be thankful for why he made us. And to what degree am I cooperating with that? If it's his will, correct? It was his will. And, and the first cultivation was that and, and actually, I take all of the Word of God as far as cultivation under this principle. This is a good principle for all of you. You should do this in your daily prayer time. Revelation of the Word, the cultivation of that Word, fruit. You should be a fruit inspector. Inspect to whether or not that Word of God is actually cultivated, meaning it changed you. 
and you can see the corresponding fruit. Well, this is a good test as ever, cultivating gratitude. Let's see how grateful you are when we're done with this message and whether or not we can repent and get more grateful in the proper way to be grateful. Not just thankful is too, uh, it's too broad of a word. I, I wanted to say, God, show me that once I enter into the gates with thanksgiving, how do I stay there? I don't want to go in and out. No. His first word to cultivate was that all true fruit comes from intimacy. So somehow I've got to stay connected. I can't keep disconnecting, getting outside, and then have to use the password again, to repent and get back in and enter with thanksgiving. You've got to have a clean heart to have thanksgiving. And a pure heart always wins. A good conscience, a sincere faith, and the end of the charge is to love out of a pure heart, out of a sincere faith. Okay, So thanksgiving can't be fake. You can't use a fake password. You've got to use the real thing. It's got to be, because it's spiritual, so it's got to be coming from the heart. It can't be, oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you, God. Oh, wow. You know, that isn't going to get you in. <laughs> Not if there's an attitude attached that's negative or ungrateful. Now, all true fruit comes from intimacy. So right there, we know that one of the keys to cultivating gratitude is it's going to demand intimacy. Apart from intimacy, you're not going to ever find true spiritual gratitude or thankfulness. And I want to know how to stay in there. And as we said before, if you want to know the purpose of a thing, don't ask the thing. Go to the source the manufacturer, or in our case, the creator. And uh, the creator, my gratitude, this is my little uh, premise, my gratitude should be in line with the purposes for which he created me. That, that way I'm going to the source instead of what my idea of gratitude is. All right? So I looked at the four predestines. And we, we, we've done this in other teachings on uh, a hierarchy of need, how to make progression. But the first one was that in Romans 8.30, it says, Moreover, whom he, meaning God, predestined that they would also be called, in other words, to come to him in a trust relationship. There's, a, there's a step one. You want to cultivate gratitude? Your trust can't be in man. Fear of man's a snare. Fear of the Lord is the emphasis God's been speaking to us as a church. The fear of the Lord. And there's a lot of people that will fall into the fear of man and call it wisdom. I had a lot of that when I was young and God was telling me to do something. I had the naysayers. I started my first church and they said, Dennis, you can't do it that way because... Uh, and it really sur surpassed all my expectations, and the business people came and were shocked at what God did. But they said, you can't do it that way because uh, you can't build a church on counseling. They saw me as a counselor. And I'm going, I don't think I'm building it on counseling, but a spirit of counsel, that's a different thing altogether. It's like the sevenfold spirit of God. A spirit of counsel is basically how to take what I know and apply it. Or wisdom is the application of knowledge. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So for me, it was, uh, I can't live by the fear of man when they were giving me advice and calling it wisdom. I saw it as the fear of man. I'm not going to listen to the advice of men if God's telling me to do something else. I'm going to obey God. So uh, one of the most important things I saw was trust. Trust has to be supernatural. Trust, you can't trust in things. You don't trust in people. You trust in God. And we've even demonstrated that in, in modules and training modules. The way God taught it to me was to make sure that it's coming from here was to, there was a warning built into it. Proverbs 3, 4, and 5. Trust in the Lord. And I see here's, my Jesus is in my spirit. He's in my innermost being. In the belly, in the gut. And it's a trust in the Lord, trust, yield, surrender. 
yield, surrender. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. That means my mind, will, and emotions, that inner court has to go along with my spirit. And my body needs to act out accordingly. Spirit, soul, and body. So it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. This leading this. Lean not. There's a built-in warning in that scripture. It always impressed me. It's a, why don't we pay? That's not there for no reason at all. It's there to guard you, to keep you safe, to give you a guardrail. Lean not on this understanding, but acknowledge. And the first time, I was just a baby Christian. I looked up that word acknowledge because then I thought I went back to the head. No, acknowledge means through divine, intimate connection. So acknowledge was not mental reasoning. He already said in the scripture, lean not on the reasoning mind, but acknowledge. That means by awareness, by touching, see, hear, feel, touch. Out of that awareness, he will direct your path. So I said, so this, it's a matter of the heart. That's the heart of the matter. Uh, trust is essential and it's fragile. Once it's broken, it needs time to be restored. The beautiful thing about trusting when it comes as a prerequisite for a relationship, it's the first foundation to build your life on, trust. And even when man fails, God is always faithful. You want an anchor for trust? Start with God, not people, not with circumstances, but with God. Because He is faithful even when you're not. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So trust, if I'm going to cultivate an attitude of gratitude, live in that spiritual dimension to where I not only am born again and see the kingdom, I have entered in the kingdom, but I don't want to keep going in and out of the kingdom. I want to stay there. And that will cultivate that attitude of gratitude. God's not going to change his password. And so there's something in me that's got to change. And that's what I saw the second uh, predestined. The first predestined is that he called us to come to him. Romans 8.30. The second predestined was God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were sinners, he died for us. For whom he foreknew, that means before you were born, he also predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son, his love nature, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So God had a plan to have a love relationship with you and really believed in you. You can reject him, but he made available a trust relationship, said that I'll never leave you or forsake you. Do you want that? And if you develop that trust and build on that trust and find out that when things don't look right to this up here, that he's still trustworthy, he will prove himself. You let God in, it's like a tiger in a cage. You can go write books about the tiger, but I'll tell you what, you let him out of the cage, he'll prove himself. All right. You let God free in your life. You surrender and yield to him. He'll prove himself to you that he is trustworthy. So when people say, well, I have trouble trusting God. You haven't tried then. You need to try. You need to fail. And then you need to try again. You need to persevere and find out that if the source that created you, the God that made you is the source of trust, anything else you, you, you do, you, oh, you're going to trust yourself. Well, good luck. How does that work? Many people think that if they're general manager of the universe, or if they can just make people do what they want them to do, they'll be happy. Uh, actually, you know, Lucifer and the angels fell because they wanted to own and not be a steward of what God would have for them. They wanted to be owners. They wanted their own kingdom. And man can do the same thing and trust in himself. But God's saying, acknowledge him through divine, intimate connection, and he will guide your path. That's how you stay in that realm. And that intimacy produces what? Fruitfulness. So it's a win-win scenario. And fruitfulness produced is worthy of thanksgiving and acknowledgement because God's doing it. Like those ten lepers. All ten should have come back. But the fact remains there's a human element in there to where people do not walk in gratitude or thanksgiving to the source. 
Who knows? There might have been a leper that was actually healed by the power of God that never served God after that either. He could have very well have gone back and got even with all the people that made fun of him. You don't know. Only one came back. I would rather say, let's stay kingdom and be the one that's grateful rather than the one who's looking for some ulterior satisfaction. Only God can really satisfy the hungry heart. So trust is a prerequisite. Trust supports everything else in the individual's life. Now, love is the second one. You are predestined for the love character. Love is the character and the nature of God, his essence. And we were created because he does love. He doesn't just have love, he is love. And we are born to be conformed to the image of Jesus. God demonstrated that love toward us, but he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Predestined. The love nature. So if you want to stay in the realm of living a grateful life, uh, actually, ungrateful people are not happy people either. I mean, it's like shooting themselves in the foot. They don't enjoy even what they could have enjoyed because it's always what's missing, what I didn't get. And I deserve. Well, like I said, I remember when God gave me that the first time. Dennis, when you think you deserve something, you deserve me and now you're serving yourself. You're playing general manager of the universe at that point. You think you're in charge. You think you can do better than God? You think you can get for yourself something more than what God can give? We've seen that as a temptation. Uh, recently we saw someone who was genuinely converted, had spiritual experience and healing, but still had so much of the ways of the world in to manipulate, to lie when you don't even have to lie. That's sad, isn't it? But that's because of a lack of being able to build the trust that's necessary. When you trust God, you don't have to manipulate people. When you trust God, you'll find out that He has your best interest at heart and He always will. But it needs cultivated. Taking matters into your own hands and living with street sense and uh, body language and, and thinking that you're learning something, it's all it's all from the evil one. You don't need that. Now, this, so the second part is that we can be conformed to his image. If I'm walking in an attitude of thanksgiving, I'm in the spirit realm. I've not only entered, but I am being conformed. There's something taking place on the inside of me. I am becoming a partaker of that divine nature. And I'm seeing that as a partaker of that divine nature, it's getting easier and easier to see, feel, and hear in that invisible realm as opposed to what is actually taking place in our culture right now, distraction. Distractions at an all-time high. But a thankful heart and a grateful heart will focus on God's original intent. I wish our, I wish, uh, our, our uh, politicians were all in agreement with original intent from the founding of this country. Original intent applies to the Bible, it applies to the founding of this country. Original intent, because people are out of the fear of man and calling it wisdom, they are watering down the gospel, they are staying away from subjects that might hurt somebody's feelings or offend them. Uh, Jesus wasn't afraid of offending as long as it was truth coming from love. If truth's coming from love, it, it's going to offend anyone in wrongdoing. They don't want to be seen. People, light came into the world, but people loved their darkness, so they, they avoided that light. They avoided that truth. It was offensive, so they hid to stay in their darkness. And that's the same in every generation. This third predestined was that not only were you predestined for a relationship, for a love relationship, to be conformed and actually be a partaker of that divine nature. But thirdly, it says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. What an honor to think that the creator of the universe, the, the God who made you, wants you to be a son or a daughter. And he created that. But we always included the word here, having predestined us as 
Sabbath sons and Sabbath daughters, meaning those who have entered with thanksgiving, entered into his courts <laughs> with praise, but then they're staying in the love of God. They're staying in that place of peace, the place of lordship, and as Sabbath sons, they've entered into a rest of faith. God wants you to stay in that rest. He prepared a rest, a rest to where you rest, God works. It is God who is at work to will and to perform through you. That's staying in the arena of the supernatural and the spiritual walk. So he predestined us to be sons and daughters for whosoever will. You know, not everybody will. Some people like their independence. I want to do it my way. <laughs> but we need to feel a sense of value or worth or meaning to life because even some of the most successful people apart from God, they're still trying to look for meaning. And unfortunately, they attach it to what they do until they're not doing that. What would an athlete, after he reaches his peak, suddenly, if his entire identity or value or worth was based on that, then he's got nothing. That's a sad commentary on man looking to himself for value and worth. When God predestined you for value and worth, to function as sons and daughters, and no matter what you did or where you went, what you have or what you don't have, there would be a satisfaction of life because you would be walking in the purpose. The thing that unsaved people can't even answer that question. What is my purpose? Why am I here? What do I do? You would have that answered in your heart and an inner knowing that I am accomplishing the purposes of God for my generation. David accomplished the purposes of God for his generation. We need to accomplish the purposes of God. Uh, that brings us to the next predestined. God had an assignment for each of us. And I like the word assignment better, mainly because uh, there's an emphasis toward the self that could very easily be sidetracked when you say, follow your dream. Well, before I follow my dream, I want to make sure it's a dream that God gave me and not something that I've concurred that thinks I think might make me happy predestined for the assignment. And I like assignment better than dream because that puts you under authority and that you're not the authority of your dream, that you're under authority, that God has divine an assignment for you and fulfillment and gratitude and thanksgiving and fruitfulness will come out of that intimacy of walking in that assignment and a heart that's always open to that assignment. To get up in the morning and say, what do we have for you? You have this written in, in the book of life for me today. Uh, Lord, I want to submit and hope that I walk in it in a way that gives you honor. I want to be thankful in it. And we are predestined to participate in his purposes for the expansion of the kingdom. And actually, when you participate in the expansion of the kingdom, God expected you to reproduce but you reproduce according to kind. You can't, if you're a bad kind, then you're only going to reproduce bad kind. God was looking for kingdom advancement, kingdom reproduction, things that, that are from the Spirit. I don't know if you can see it or not, but in these predestined, if I see gratitude, I've got to see gratitude in light of why did God even make me? Not what do I think would make me happy. Why did God make me? He made me for these four things. I'm going to be thankful for these things and find the fulfillment and the satisfaction as an individual. And one of the things of ingratitude is comparing yourself with other people. So-and-so has or doesn't have. I have this, you have that. Da, da, da. That is the personification of demonic ingratitude. Comparing themselves amongst themselves, no wisdom whatsoever. And that, that is a, a warning in all of this. Understanding the assignment for each of us. We have, we have obtained an inheritance, Ephesians 1.11. Predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now that's interesting. Who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Ephesians 1.5 says that we are... We have value and worth, and we need to function out of that value and worth 
out of Ephesians 1.5, but Ephesians 1.11 says that we need to have a purpose to reproduce according to that value and worth. And God is saying, I've called you according to the purpose, but it adds clarity to a verse that people use all the time. Romans 8, 28, and you've heard them say this. You've heard Christians say this all the time. All things are working together for the good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Oh, wait a minute. It's not a blanket statement that all things are working together for the good. We sometimes stop it right there. All things are working together for good to those who love God who are called according to His purpose. You want to stay in that supernatural realm of fulfilling the purposes of God with a thankful heart. Because this, this all things work together for the good, applies to the things that are happening. Even the bad things that happen, you are not thankful for the bad things. You are thankful in the bad things. And God can take those bad things and turn them into triumphs. But one thing he can't do is bless your ingratitude. He can't do that, and he won't. So, if we were uh, called according to his purpose, I, I, I think even, even at this part of the message, I want to just stop and just pray for those of you that are watching. And, and uh, let's pray for, for thank, let's pray those predestined. Pray those for as a form of prayer. First of all, Holy Spirit, guide me into the truth that I am grateful for that relationship that I have with God. I am so grateful. Oh, I didn't find God. He found me and reached out to me. And I am so grateful that I responded. I am so grateful that he came into my life, changed me. I am grateful that God alone not only came into my life for a relationship, a love relationship, he wanted to be with me. He wanted a relationship. He wanted a spirit to spirit. He wanted a heart to heart with me. He wanted a, a breath to breath, heart to heart, spirit to spirit with you as well. He longed for that. See, he is love, but even God has a need in a sense. What's that need? His need is that his essence of love needs to be poured out, and he has poured it out by the power of the Holy Spirit upon us. I receive right now the revelation that God has opened the window of heaven and poured out. I want to be a recipient of that, and I receive forgiveness for any walls that have guarded myself from welcoming such lavish, extravagant love. I may be walking to him uh, uh, gradually, opening the door a crack, but God is running toward me and he's waiting for that, that opportunity to just lavish you with extravagant love. I want that extravagant love. I'm going to fling the door open. What have I got to lose? I'm going to trust God and I'm going to remove all those excuses. Right now I receive forgiveness for all those excuses of not being able to trust God. And, and I receive forgiveness for that and I fling open the door. If you are who you say you are, God, come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin. And I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. And in the process, I'm going to be grateful that you're the one that can change me. I can't change me. You and you alone can change me. I am welcoming uh, that, uh, that word. I'm receiving that word with meekness that's able to save my soul, to change my soul, to transform me from glory to glory, faith to faith, victory to victory. I'm grateful, Lord, for the third aspect of my predestined, that you accepted me as a son or a daughter. I don't know, but growing up apart from God, acceptance was a big deal to me. But now it's a really big deal knowing that you lavish and give me your undivided attention and full acceptance. You accepted me into the beloved relationship. And so I received that acceptance Purge out any rejection that might have been left over in my heart and in my life. Purge out any of these things, for I am 
opening wide to the acceptance that comes from the supernatural God who is loving, accepted, total acceptance. And lastly, you've got a daily plan for me. I'm opening up my heart for your plan, not my plan, not what I think make me happy, not my manipulations. But I want to open up to being grateful for the plan, the daily plan that you gave me, whether I think it's exciting or not exciting, whether I think it's uh, big or small, has nothing to do with me. You saw before I was born. You saw me before I was born. Oh, that we would right now take in the love that he had for us before you were even formed in your mother's womb. He saw you and loved you. Wow, I didn't even have a chance to be Dennis the Menace. I didn't even have a chance to be bad. And he lavished me before I was formed in my mother's womb. He knew me and saw me in Jesus to lavish extravagant love upon me. And before I was born, every day of my life was recorded in his book. Every moment was laid out before a single day passed. Wow, that means every moment of my daily life is an opportunity to stay in the kingdom or to respond in some negative way. Every moment is a seed of opportunity for transformation. Every moment, regardless of the circumstance, is an opportunity for me to respond as opposed to reacting. Showing him uh, that not a single day goes before me that I don't lay my life before him. I can remember seeing people's lives transformed, saying, uh, my life came together when I put all the pieces of my life out before him. He put it together. I'm saying, let's put all of the pieces of our life together for him on a daily basis and let him. It's kind of like the, the child who, uh, when they were learning to pray in tongues, they said, it's like a box of cereal, like alphabets. You just give him all the letters and he makes the prayer. Well, you know what? We should be childlike in that sense and place before him all of, the, all of our life and let him put the sentences together. He'll give us a word in prayer, yes, but God wants to make sentences. He wants to make paragraphs. He wants to make a living epistles that are making a statement to the people around us and the people in this world according to the plans and the purposes that he laid out beforehand. You don't set your schedule. I learned that the, the, the hard way when I had every 15 minutes uh, laid out for my life. And God said, I'm not on Eastern time. I'm not on Rocky Mountain time. I'm not on Central time. And I'm not on your time, Dennis. I'm on Spirit time. And I had to make the adjustment to get on his timetable. So I'm grateful for the God that called me into relationship. I'm God, grateful that God is the only one that can change me. I'm grateful that I'm a son uh, uh, unto him. I'm grateful that God has a daily plan for my life. It should be an adventure then. If we really locked into that truth that every day, even the mundane duties of the day, that he has a plan. Brother Lawrence learned that somehow. Somehow he'd pick up a straw from the floor and he was doing it with the, his love toward God. He found a way to stay in that kingdom realm of being grateful and thankful. Picking up dirt from your floor, sweeping the dirt, you can glorify God. Yes, you can. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. Oh, so God is approved by that. I'm thankful that I can trust God because he's faithful. Even when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. But he cannot deny who he is. Wow, that's an anchor to hold on to. Love God with his holy love. We love because he first loved us. You can't even love without his love. You can't forgive without his forgiveness. You can't, you can't live without his life. I can enjoy my purpose, be fruitful, multiply, and expand the kingdom. Now, here's something that's a, a little how-to that I saw for maintaining or cultivating gratitude. And here's the way that God showed it to me. I've taught this in the past as how the Word is made flesh. Okay, So let's make 
In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Let's make that flesh. Not just quote it, make it flesh. How do I make it flesh? Well, first thing is I have to make a choice, both outwardly to do something about it, inwardly, I've got to discipline myself that that word, I want to meet the author of that word, that in everything, everything, give thanks. My mind doesn't comprehend everything, but God, you put it in your word, so I want to meet the author of that word. In everything, give thanks. And what I'm doing is I'm absorbing or internalizing it. And one of the things the Lord showed me is that what happens when it takes, when you absorb, when you internalize, when it gets written on the tablet of your heart, you birthed an attitude. Well, I'm trying to birth in everything, give thanks. So if something supernatural transpires, if his word becomes flesh in my life, I'm going to have thankfulness in there. It's going to be layered somehow. It's going to be a partaker of the divine nature. So then, at some level, being a partaker, it's now entered that Jesus, the Word, is now my value system at some level. Okay, so now i got to go to work. All right, this is in my prayer closet. This is where I'm feasting and absorbing. But he birthed that attitude. He birthed a hunger and a thirst to be thankful in everything. That's not for everything, in everything. It put, keeps me in that spirit realm, independent from what's going on around me. Particularly, it's a now word for now, because I see distraction with Christians winning in many cases. Let's cause that to halt, to cease and desist distractions having power over me. For greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And that's going to be a declaration that we need to make on a regular basis. Now, he birthed that attitude in me. What attitude is he birthing in me? Thanksgiving, gratitude. Okay. And here's what I saw. Okay, Dennis, you have a scripture. You cultivate the scripture. There should be fruit. What would the fruit look like? Well, my value system now is, is in everything give thanks. I'm going to maintain that connection. If I blow it, I'm going to have to say, I received forgiveness. <laughs> I was not thankful, God. I want, to be, I want to feel conviction when I blow it, and I'm not grateful. I receive forgiveness. I want to maintain that connection. And just as coming in, an attitude of gratitude was birthed, going out, an attitude of gratitude becomes then my love motivation. My love motivation, so everything that I do or I hear, it's love worketh in me and through me. It becomes the outworking or the redemptive will of God. Is it the will of God? And everything give thanks for this is the will of God. So then working out of me will be a supernatural expression that everything is working together for the good to them that love God and are called according to his purposes. I'm walking in, a, in an attitude of gratitude. The motivation is the love of God. Everything is birthed from love. But my behavior is redemptive will. Loving will. What is the loving will? In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Can you see how the word becomes flesh? But I don't want to just walk around quoting and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You have to know it, yes. You have to even be in to speak it because what you say reveals what's in your heart, good or bad. But I've seen people say the right words but the heart wasn't there yet. So I'm saying let's go back to how to make that word become flesh. How do I birth an attitude? by being a God-welcoming individual, allowing that word to be birthed inside once it becomes even marginally real. You know when you read the scriptures and something's quickened to you, that marginal real, don't treat that lightly. That's not a small thing. That is God giving you a now word. That is not small. That should be cherished. It should be absorbed. It should be birthed. 
And uh, birthing is a process that, remember Paul said, oh, that, I, that, that Christ would be conformed in you. Again, I labor that Christ be formed in you. He saw it as a progressive revelation of an unfolding truth. And you do that by bringing it in, absorbing, internalizing. Uh, people use different words, uh, meditate, but it's really the birthing of an attitude when it takes. When that word becomes flesh in you, you own it. And it will be easier to do than not to do. Not that you can't not do it, but it'll be easier to obey than to not obey. That's when you know it took at some level. And that if it took at some level, it becomes part of your value package. It becomes part of who you are. Remember, to be conformed to his image was the second predestined. You were, you were called to a relationship. You were called to be conformed. Well, now it's being conformed. And what's happening? If you're walking out of this and you're maintaining that attitude of gratitude, you're also walking as a Sabbath son, Sabbath daughter. You're walking in the rest of faith. You're walking in the peace of God. And whatever you do, it is God who is at work to will and to perform. And what's he doing? He's performing his redemptive will. You can't perform a redemptive will. You have to let God perform his redemptive will through you. For it is God who is at work to both will and to perform. So your outworking behavior is redemptive. And you're reproducing according to kind. Someone could be listening to this right now and it'd be reproducing, reproducing, reproducing. They're taking it to heart. It's being written on the tablet of the heart. They're going to walk it out. And they're going to be grateful. And it's going to silence the noise of the enemy. It's going to silence. It's, and we command it to cease and desist. Because you're a rat with a loudspeaker. That's what the devil is. He's a rat with a loudspeaker. But you, we have a tendency to think volume is somehow uh, authority. Volume is not authority. You can have the same anointing quietly walking by someone as you can shouting a message. Uh, volume does not control authority. And it's true for the enemy, too. His volume is like a rat with a loudspeaker. When you consider the source, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Your authority, don't give it up to sidetracks. Don't give it up to distraction. And certainly don't give it up to... Uh, what we're, we're also seeing something taking place right now. Besides the fear of man and the fear of the Lord being in conflict right now, even amongst Christians... Watering down, finding a middle road, thinking you're going to be safe. Uh -huh. That's the two-headed dragon. I saw that praying with people, that mom and dad were having a knockdown drag out in the living room, and the little kid was terrified, so they ran in the closet, and the demon says, you're safe in here. Fear will not keep you safe, and don't call it wisdom, because that's what's taking place now. The other thing, too, is because people want to take matters back into, they want to see stability, and they're not looking for God as their stability in these times. They're looking uh, to avoid Holy Spirit and go back to the cerebral mindset. Understanding the scriptures with your head isn't going to do it. And be careful that you're not calling the Holy Spirit the devil. God's saying, if you are truly grateful, you will see what you are predestined for, and your gratitude and your thanksgiving will flow toward those four predestines. For those of you that are note takers, you like to write that down. It's Romans 8.30, Romans 8.29, Ephesians 1.5, and Ephesians 1.11. Those four scriptures use the word predestined. I want to know what God's plan is, not my plan. And he's going to have a better outcome for my life because he planned it before I was born. I want to walk in those things that God has called. Now, <clears throat> here's, a, here's my daily plan for prayer. You can do this if you want, or you can skip it. But this is the way I've been working on this stuff. First of all, God's purpose is to enter his gates with thanksgiving. So I start right there. I simply go, God, I'm, I'm thankful for all that you've planned for my life. And I want to line up to my assignment. And the first thing I do is I, I enjoy the fact of Psalm 139, 17. 
every single moment you're thinking of me. Oh, that's a relationship. Whoa, I could trust that, couldn't you? How precious are your thoughts toward me. Constantly, I'm in your every thought. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to reciprocate. And I don't have that kind of love. I need his love to reciprocate. How wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, you desire toward me are more than the grains of the sands of the sea. Picture a beach. All of those wonderful grains are sands of his love and thoughts toward you. Wow, I can't comprehend them. But when I awake, he's still with me. Wow. I want to enter his gates. I want to enjoy his thoughts toward me. Not my runaway thoughts, not the stuff that uh, trying to distract me. The third thing, I want to reciprocate. And Hebrews 12, 2 says, I'm going to look away from all of distractions today. And I'm going to look unto Jesus, who is the leader and the source of my faith. See, it's like prevenient prayer. There will be distractions during the day. But if you pray this in advance, I promise you, they will have less impact. Because you, you were praying ahead of the devil, the world, the flesh, and the devil. All right? I want to listen to you, but I realize that I have to quiet my soul like a weaned child resting in his mother, like a weaned child at rest. I've got to quiet that mind, will, and emotions and submit them back to you. But then, God, you know what? I want to go further. I don't want to think for a moment that I've arrived in any way, shape, or form. This one thing I do, I'm going to press toward what lies ahead. And I'm going to say, search me, O God. That's the fifth area. I want to be God-searched, not me. I like going to the source, the God that made me. Let him search me. He made me. He knit me together. If there's tangles, he knows where they're at. Search me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful way in me. Cleanse me of that. And then last, not last, but sixth, it is God who is at work in me to will and to do. I'm going to appreciate the grace of God, the presence of Jesus working in my life so I can obey His grace, His empowerment for me to live the life. And lastly, His grace is to be and to do. I'm making a commitment that when I leave my prayer time, I'm going to demonstrate this. I'm going to act it out in some way as the Spirit leads. Because when it pleased God, He separated me from my mother's womb and called me through His grace. This is Galatians 1, 15 and 16. These are like landmark scriptures. He called me through His grace to first reveal His Son in me that I might preach. Some people get that backwards. They, they're finding their identity in their preaching or their gifting. No, no. To reveal his son in me is the priority. And then preach that. Preach that reality. You're preaching then the living word. And we, we, we are going to seal this now by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I hope that daily plan works for you because it's going to work. It's going to bring us into a realm of thanksgiving and gratitude that we've never known before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.